Hello, and welcome back to another one of my Apes videos. This video will be on Chapter 3, Module 7, and we are going to get into the cycling of matter. Let's start by saying that matter cycles through the biosphere. What exactly is the biosphere? I'm sure you've heard of the atmosphere, you've heard of the hydrosphere perhaps. Well, these spheres are layers that surround Earth, and the biosphere happens to be the combination of all ecosystems that inhabit Earth. So that is the biosphere. The way that matter cycles is through what we call the biogeochemical cycles. This is the movement of matter within and between ecosystems involving biological, geologic, and chemical processes. The first of the biogeochemical cycles that we're going to look at is the hydrologic cycle. Now this is a cycle that you have probably heard of from even kindergarten and you definitely know of from your day-to-day -day activities. Right? We've got the rain, we've got evaporation, and it's really just the movement of water through all these different processes. So let's take a look at a more in-depth Apes view of this process that you're already familiar with. So as I mentioned before, there is water on Earth, right, the hydrosphere, and there's going to be a lot of sunlight that hits that massive body of water that's roughly 70% of the Earth's surface. That's going to lead to a good amount of evaporation, and that's where step number one takes us in our diagram. So solar energy heats Earth and causes evaporation. So once it hits that water, it evaporates, turns from a liquid into a gas, and it's going to rise up temperature as you go up is going to fall, right? You're away from the surface that's being heated and it's going to get cold. That leads us to step two. Evaporated water condenses into clouds. So if evaporation was the transfer from a liquid into a gas, here it's cooling down and it's changing from a vapor back into liquid droplets. Now after a while they're going to build up, accumulate, and become very, very large droplets. In this case, we're going to go to step three, where water returns to Earth as precipitation. Now, depending on the temperature, it could come down as rain, could come down as snow, or it could even come down as hail, which we'll cover later when we get more in depth with weather. So step three is precipitation. Once that falls, that leads to step four. Either it's going to enter the ground through infiltration, which is the word for that water seeping into the actual dirt, you know, the ground itself, or it's going to turn into what we call surface runoff, where instead of going into the ground, it's going to build into a body of water, such as a river, find its way into a lake, and eventually make its way into the ocean. Now, that's not to say that once infiltration occurs, that doesn't also make its way to the ocean. As you can see, underneath, by the infiltration arrow, the groundwater is also moving. But instead of a fast uh, or even a lazy river, the groundwater is going to be moving very, very slowly. So it's going to take many, many years before it finally reaches that body of water, just like the runoff does. Now that was perhaps a simplified view of how the water is cycling in an environment. We have many, many things that we as humans do to the environment that are going to change how water is infiltrating or running off. For example, you can see that there's that dirt patch on the right side of this diagram that shows that there is a massive amount of runoff. One fact that you must know is that if there is vegetation, trees, shrubs, something like that, it's going to help the water infiltrate, get into the ground. Whereas if it is cut away, especially on a steep bank, it's going to turn into runoff. So we definitely have a big impact on how much water makes it into the ground. This is also true for anything that is blacktop, right? Any asphalt we put down, concrete, things that are impermeable, where water can't get through it. So where we have any of those roads in the picture, we also are not helping the water get into the ground. We didn't mention this before, but in the last picture, we had evaporation coming from the ocean and a little bit from the soil. There's also evaporation happening from the trees and other plant life. We call that transpiration. And one of the other words that because of that's existence, uh, evapotranspiration is just talking about all the evaporation that takes place within everything. So that's another word that might come up. The next cycle that we're going to talk about is the carbon cycle. So I'm sure that a lot of you remember from living environment that CO2 is in the air and it is a big part of both photosynthesis and respiration. And that is where points one and two are going to take us. So if you take a look at this diagram that's in your textbook, Number one, producers convert CO2 into sugar, right? Part of the respiration and photosynthesis equations is played out with CO2. So CO2 is a thing that 
photosynthesis requires so that it can make those sugars and well, fuel the plant. So that brings us to number two, sugars are converted back into CO2, right? So when we are having our cells go through the process of respiration, we are breaking down sugars, breaking down those things so that we can get energy and a byproduct is CO2 enters back into the atmosphere. So it's a little bit of a balancing act and while the decomposers are there to break down what's left in our actual tissues, uh, there's really no difference at the end of the cycle naturally. So it's uh, what we call a steady state that what is taken out is put back in at a relatively equal amount. Also with this, there is burial, which is number three. Uh, some things aren't fully decomposed and they're going to get buried underneath different rock and sediment layers. So they're going to eventually turn into fossil fuels, right? Which are like oil, natural gas, and coal. But before we get to that, I also want to point out that in the left-hand side of the picture, you also have all of these things we were talking about with one and two happening in the ocean. So you do have producers such as algae or some kind of seaweed and the respiration going on of those plants as well as the marine organisms. So again, we've got this balancing act going on, but it's not in land, it's or on land, it's in the sea. So that is going on and there is burial in the sea as well. So that leads us to number four, human extraction of fossil fuels brings carbon to Earth's surface where it can be combusted, right? We extract fuel, we extract coal, and when we burn these things, they are going to release CO2. That then leads us to five. CO2 in the atmosphere and CO2 dissolved in water are constantly exchanged. So all that CO2 goes into the atmosphere, which is really always touching the ocean, right? There's no layer between them. So they are freely exchanging gases between each other. And lastly, number six, combustion converts fossil fuels and plant material into CO2. Well, we kind of covered that with four, but that is the process of carbon. Really, it's just being taken in for those two big natural processes and we are adding to it via burning fossil fuels. This brings us to one of the more involved cycles, the nitrogen cycle. So we must begin by talking about this by first talking about macronutrients and limiting nutrients. So nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur are all considered macronutrients. These are referred to as macronutrients and needed in very large amounts because they are useful for building tissue, bones, and helping out the nervous system of the different organisms that take them in. So a limiting nutrient is anything that really limits the growth of something in an environment. So nitrogen, while it is something that is readily available in the atmosphere, is not exactly the most available thing when it comes to the soil. So it can be the thing that is limiting the growth of the area. Really think about it. If there's enough water, if there's enough space, but there's not enough nitrogen, it still can't grow. There is an abundance of nitrogen in our atmosphere. It is really the primary gas that we breathe in and interact with on a daily basis. So. The first place we're going to start in the cycle is going to be with the atmosphere and its conversion from a gas into something that can be readily used. So step one is going to be nitrogen fixation, converting that atmospheric nitrogen 2 or N2 directly into ammonia, NH3, which is done by bacteria that is in the roots of legumes. And that's something like chickpeas or peanuts they have this awesome relationship with these bacteria where they kind of get the free nitrogen because they live by the roots. So it's a really nice relationship for them to have and it helps out the other plants around them as well. NH3 or ammonia is readily formed to NH4 ammonium in the soil. And this can also happen abiotically, not through something living, turning into, into nitrate NO3 minus. Step two, assimilation. Producers take up ammonium or nitrate. So nitrate is NO3 minus, um, and that is really, this assimilation is where the plants are taking in the nitrogen that they can use. Again, a plant can't just breathe in the atmospheric nitrogen in the air. So it needs that first step, nitrogen fixation, and then once it's converted, it can finally take up that nitrogen and assimilate it into itself. Uh, consumers assimilate nitrogen by eating producers. So this is where now we're going through the food chain and bringing nitrogen up from the plant who got it from the bacteria to, well, us eating peanuts, right? The consumer 
But unfortunately, all things that are living must die. So, a modification step three is going to occur where decomposers are going to be breaking down dead things in the soil and getting those nitrogen compounds into ammonium, NH4+. Step four, nitrification, is where nitrifying bacteria convert ammonium, that NH4+, into nitrite and then back into nitrate. This is one of those words that gets very tricky, or two words that get tricky because they sound so similar, nitrite, nitrate, but they are different, NO2 minus and then NO3 minus. The big difference is that NO3 minus is usable by plants where NO2 minus is not. And again, this is done by what we call nitrifying bacteria. So a lot of these things, these conversions, are being done by living things, mostly these bacteria. And the last step is denitrification. So this is where it is going to, or the nitrogen is, going to return back into the atmosphere. So again, with bacteria being involved, we've got the denitrifying bacteria, aptly named, converting nitrate, again NO3 minus, the stuff that is usable by plants, into nitrous oxide and eventually nitrogen gas, which is going to be the N2 that's in the atmosphere. So that is basically all the steps in the process and yes it is very confusing with the different bacteria going from one to another uh, to an organism to it dying to it breaking down it can get very hairy but that's why drawing this out and really looking at each step is going to be important and yes you do need to know each step the last part of this uh, that we'll talk about is leaching so negatively charged particles repel soil so nitrate right again that minus NO2 minus as well uh, with nitrite is transported through soil uh, with water so because of the properties of water the ne negatively charged particles are actually going to be moving a little bit this does play some effect into where nitrogen is going to end up especially important because we want to know where it's going to be for those plants so as I said before, this can get a little bit scary with all the different steps and the different things that are involved to convert from one thing to another. But this picture does a very, very nice job of pointing out every single route that the nitrogen can go. And you might've been wondering, well, what are the processes, those abiotic processes that could get the atmospheric nitrogen to be converting into nitrate or something else? If you look at the left, lightning and combustion uh, or something from us, right? Some industrial fertilizer production can lead to, if you follow that blue arrow, lead to nitrate, that usable nitrogen that, well, plants need to grow. So that's one way that we can go from the N2 directly into usable nitrogen for plants. The other way was with step one nitrogen fixation, which was through those bacteria, and we'll get you the ammonia, which will go to ammonium through bacteria once again, and then eventually lead to nitrate, uh, nitrite, and then nitrate. Again, a little confusing, but the picture does a good job of really showing every single arrow and every process that's going on. So I would certainly study over this picture. This unsightly mess is the result of a lake that has too much nitrogen. The first thing that's going to get a hold of the new nitrogen that's in the environment is, after runoff, the water. And once the water has a bunch of nitrogen in it, it's going to have algae that is going to what we call bloom or reproduce very, very quickly. This also happens in the ocean, if you've ever heard of brown tides that happen around Long Island. So you can have these huge algal blooms that are not very good. And what this is going to do is it's going to block out light to the rest of the environment, kill off plants, and eventually that nitrogen is going to run out. And what's gonna to happen to all these algae when they have no food? They're going to die. And when they die, they're going to sink, decompose, take up all the oxygen, and suffocate most things that are in the area of their death. So it can be a huge problem if you have a huge algal bloom in a lake. So yes, nitrogen in the area is going to affect perhaps some tree growth, some shrub growth, but this is the big effect that we really want to avoid, where we have these blooms that are toxic to most things that live in the lakes and they can definitely have a huge negative impact on an ecosystem, especially in a smaller lake. Phosphorus, like nitrogen, is also very important for plant growth. Uh, just like nitrogen can be a limiting factor, phosphorus can also be a limiting factor. The reason that phosphorus is so important is because it is a huge part of DNA, 
and also ATP. So plants very much need this and well, if they don't have it, they're not going to grow as well. So let's take a look at where phosphorus comes from and how it cycles. Let's start with number one. Weathering of uplifted rocks contributes phosphates to the land. Some phosphates make their way back to the ocean. So you can see that there is going to be some that's going to wash into a body of water and some that is going to be just what we call weathered or broken down and be part of the terrestrial environment. Two, phosphate fertilizer applied to fields can run off directly onto streams, or I'm sorry, into streams, become part of a soil pool or be absorbed by so you can see with step two that we are mining the rocks because that's really where they're withheld, this phosphate, which is pretty much in the same form throughout this entire cycle and also is going to be in a solid. We are mining it and then we are using it for agricultural purposes, which will mostly get into the plants, but also is going to find its way to a body of water eventually. So let's look at number three now. Three. Excretion by animals and decomposition of both animals and plants release phosphates on land or in water. And again, with it being on land, eventually it is going to either be absorbed by another plant, uh, eaten by another animal, and then find its way eventually into the water somehow, some way. So you can see with four, dissolved phosphates precipitate or fall out of the solution uh, and contribute to the ocean sediments. Conversion of sediments into phosphate rocks is a very slow process. So here, after it's gone through the land, through the trees, through some organisms, and found its way to the water, it's eventually going to uh, solidify out of the water. Step four is going to be extremely long in terms of how long it takes for each of those little pieces of phosphate precipitate to fall and eventually form a rock. And this takes so long that by the time it finally forms a rock, it's not going to enter the cycle for who knows? It could be anywhere from hundreds to thousands of years. So if there are geologic forces that lift up the phosphate rocks from the ocean floor, uh, then it's going to form those into mountains. So this is where perhaps you've heard of tectonic plates, right? They smash into each other. Those are going to lift the land up and they're going to expose those rocks to step one, weathering, right? Of these uplifted rocks and the cycle will continue on. This brings us to our last cycle, the sulfur cycle. So if you take a look at the bottom right, you'll see the natural order of how the sulfur cycle usually works, right? You have sulfur that's in rock uh, and in soil, and that is taken up by plants, which will then go through the food chain. Those things will die and decay, and it will go back into the soil. Also, if you look in the middle of this picture, you'll see that there is sulfur dioxide that is thrown into the atmosphere by volcanoes. This is a totally natural process. Sulfur is going to come out of the gas from an eruption and it will eventually fall back. If you look at the right, right, as sulfuric acid. So uh, some of this sulfuric acid rain, or in other words, acid rain, is actually natural uh, part of well, volcanic eruptions. There's also in the ocean, if you look at the left, sulfur in the ocean sediment, and you're going to have bacteria that are going to produce dimethyl sulfide as a gas, and that will go into the atmosphere. So those are all the natural ways that sulfur is going to cycle. But if you look, there's that big red arrow coming from the rock and the soil, and that is mining and extraction. So where you have fossil fuels, you're going to have mining, and that's going to lead to things that are going to create more sulfur dioxide. So that would be smelting, uh, the melting of metals, right? Burning coal and refining fossil fuels, which are going to increase the amount of sulfur dioxide, and they will make even more acid rain than we had before.